So uh, good evening to everyone who's joining us here after the museum's AGM. The Thunder Bay Museum is on the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, a signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. We recognize that the story of this region goes back much farther than settlement, and our history includes the contributions of many Indigenous peoples and communities over the centuries. As we're participating tonight from home or from other private spaces, I encourage you to reflect on the history of the land you're on and its first peoples and think about your relationship to this land. Tonight marks the final installment of our 2020-2021 lecture series, and it's been a year. We are very grateful to have been able to present these lectures online to so many of you. Uh, much thanks goes out to all of this year's speakers and to the museum staff for making this all possible. As with previous lectures, a recording of tonight's session will be made and will be available on the museum's YouTube channel in days to come. You're very encouraged to, as well to check out any of this year's sessions that you might have missed. Plans for the next set of public lectures, whether those will be online or returning to in-person or some hybrid of the two, will be made over the summer. So keep an eye out for developments. During tonight's session, please feel free to make use of the Q&A feature on Zoom. We will make sure there will be lots of opportunity for questions to be asked and answered after the main presentation concludes. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, you can also um, let Scott or myself know about that through the Q&A feature or through the chat. Our speaker this evening is Ian Angus. Ian is the Secretary and Project Manager for the Friends of Chippewa Park. He has a background in public service, including being elected to all three orders of government, as well as working for both the Recreation and Parks Departments of the City of Thunder Bay. As a consultant, he developed feasibility studies for a number of municipalities and First Nations in the Northwest, as well as conducting transportation and forest operation research. He is a founding director of the Friends of Chippewa Park and considers the park to be his neighborhood as he was raised at the park when his family operated the tourist camp from 1945 to 1970. Go ahead, Ian, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Sarah, and good evening, everybody. I'm very pleased to, uh, to have this opportunity and I wanna thank the, uh, the staff and the board of the Thunder Bay Museum in including uh, Chippewa Park uh, in its uh, lecture series. I'm gonna try and compress 100 years into a very short period of time. So please bear with me if I speak a little fast, uh, and I've tried to make sure that the slides help to tell the story. I'm calling this presentation, Build It and They Will Come, and then Maintain It and They Will Come, and Program It and They Will Come. The park officially opened July 15, 1921. One of the key things that, that uh, people need to understand about Chippewa Park was how it was operated. Uh, during its first, uh, uh, seven, well, I guess uh, 50 years, it was managed by the Fort Wayne Board of Parks Management. This was a group uh, that was initially appointed by council uh, and then uh, actually sought uh, election at the civic elections. And their sole purpose was managing parks and recreation. Unlike today where uh, parks and recreation is just one part of what city council has to, uh, has to deal with they were able to concentrate uh, their efforts on this endeavor. The other context was the, the at the time that Chippewa was created, there was a trend across North America called City Beautiful, recognition that parks were extremely important to the well-being of every community, uh, and Fort William and Port Arthur uh, were, were, were not unique in, in, in following that. Although there was a competitive level, as we've known uh, for from a number of our the presentations that Port Arthur and Fort William tried to outdo each other, whether it was in attracting uh, new businesses or in terms of uh, how good looking their parks could be. And so that sort of started the, uh, the, roll, the, the ball rolling in terms of Chippewa Park. One of the, the interesting things that uh, I found in a, uh, uh, and I need to, sorry, I need to stop for a sec because the, uh, the pictures, oh, the pictures on the side are uh, are blocking my screen. So bear with me for just a sec. Um, anybody know how I can get rid of those little uh, I, the images on the right hand side? 
Oh, wait, here it is. Okay. No. Nope. Minimize. There we go. Okay. So one of the uh, the realities of Fort William was it was built on flat, originally swampy land. But the Fort William First Nation reserved had much more prominent features. Mount McKay, uh, the shoreline of Lake Superior, uh, solid ground. And as uh, Eugenio Padavosi uh, wrote in a paper for Dr. Tronru uh, years ago uh, that uh, the, the fathers of Fort William looked south uh, towards the, the reserve for the possible location of a future park. William A. Dowler was the first chair of the Fort William Board of Parks Management. He was also uh, the founder of the Thunder Bay District Municipal League. He was an entrepreneur, a lawyer, and later a judge. And he is credited as, as being the founder of Chippewa Park. He took great pains to get to know the, uh, the members of the Fort Wayne First Nation Band, uh, had regular discussions with them, and was the chief negotiator for, for the land. And you can see his uh, uh, carved features on the cairn at the entrance to Chippewa Park. One of the key elements uh, is how, do, how did we acquire the land? There actually were two parcels uh, of, of land involved. The first one was 270.1 acres, which is about 91, 92% of the total land mass of Chippewa Park. That's the area shown in the, uh, the, the greenish yellow hashtags in two parcels on the map on the right. Uh, over about nine years, uh, the uh, Fort Wayne Board of Parks Management and the city of Fort William uh, were in negotiations with the band and the band kept pushing back. Uh, they didn't like the uh, amount of money that was offered they didn't like the benefits that were offered. But finally in 1917, a negotiated benefit agreement and a negotiated uh, sale uh, was achieved. The second parcel, 27.7 acres, and that's shown at the top of the map in the uh, sort of the reddish purple area. It's the area along the shoreline. It includes the tourist camp, the pavilion, the beach, and the former uh, the Chippewa cottages, along with the location of the two docks. That land was leased from the CNR uh, and then purchased in 1963. But it's important to note that those, that parcel was part of the 1600 acres taken by the Crown from the reserve for the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway Terminal. And although uh, the elevator terminal was built, the railway terminus really never happened the way that before we wanted it. Um, all of the details of the land acquisition can be found on our website, chippewapark.ca slash history, uh, including the actual agreements uh, between the band and uh, the city, the agreement with the CNR, as well as, as the, uh, the research paper that I referred to earlier. So in the early years, uh, clearing began in 1920. On July 6, 1921, the park was named it was named Chippewa Park uh, in, in recognition of the original owners of the land, Chippewa being the, the label that uh, the, the settlers applied to the Ojibwe's of this area. And uh, July 15th, uh, Mayor Dennis officially opened uh, the, uh, the park. He, he and his party came by boat. Uh, and to show how safe the water was, he donned the bathing suit and waded in uh, to the delight of all those in attendance. Uh, more clearing occurred from 21 to 22. Construction of the street railway started. Uh, a refreshment booth, short store, and pavilion were constructed. And the first employee hired to operate uh, the facilities for the summer of 23. And the long history of animal uh, attractions at Chippewa was started by the Honorable H. Mills, the MPP for Fort William and Minister of Mines, who donated a coon, and I assume that that is a raccoon, and squirrels. Uh, to the park. But it didn't take long for Mother Nature to intervene. And uh, I'm assuming that the majority of the buildings were had canvas walls and they were destroyed quite quickly. Uh, Parks Board then started to build more permanent structures. And the, the Daily Times Journal reported that their description was that with their gnarled pillars of tree trunks and with a limb-like tracery evident everywhere, it does not take much of an effort of the imagination to see the set of buildings as something that has arisen almost without the aid of human hands, the work of the woodland spirits. 
The buildings are truly Sylvan and breathe the spirit of the great outdoors. All of the beams in these buildings were harvested from the park itself, uh, both the, the horizontal as well as the vertical buildings. And uh, John Thunder, who was an Ojibwe from the Sault Ste. Marie, Sault Ste. Marie area, living at uh, Forty First Nation, uh, was actually the designer and uh, uh, builder uh, of the uh, the three buildings, which were then joined together. And you can see on the left uh, what's labeled as one of two dance halls. Three rooms in there, each one uh, played a different role depending on the era. And the dance halls moved around, the dining room moved around, the, uh, the concession moved around. Here's the first of one of the three canteens. Uh, it was in the, uh, the most north, uh, westerly uh, building. And when we did the renovations, we tried to, uh, to emulate its structure in the center room. Elsewhere in the park, a lodge was built. It held nine rooms that were rented out. Uh, had a matron who, uh, who lived in, in the facility all summer long. Mrs. Green was the, uh, uh, the last uh, matron of the facility. Um, it was initially on the, the beach uh, by the swimming area, but then was relocated to be close to the tourist camp, which made much more sense in terms of its operation. I want to highlight three, three men who played major roles in the development of Chippewa Park uh, over the first 50 to 70, 80 years. On the left is Bill Hollenbeck. He was the superintendent of the park from 1927 to 1963. He's shown here with, uh, with Teddy, one of the famous uh, occupants of the, uh, the animal enclosures. In the center is Frank Banning. He started at Chippewa as a student, uh, went off to war, came back, was employed seasonally, i.e. the summer. Then he became a full-time parkman. And he eventually ended up being the first superintendent of Chippewa Park after amalgamation, and then went on to be the assistant superintendent of parks for the city. He was crucial in constructing the most recent iteration of the wildlife exhibit. And on the right, uh, holding uh, our famous snowball, uh, the snow, polar bear snow club, snow cub, uh, was Art Widnell, who was the secretary treasurer of the Fort Wayne Board of Parks Management from 1930 to 1964. Uh, he was also uh, in charge of tourism for the city of Fort William. But three men who had pivotal roles in the development of the park over many, many years. Tourist Camp. This is the first purpose-built tourist facility in Northwestern Ontario. The civic leaders, Art Woodnell, the Board of Parks Management, recognized that once that outlaw bridge to the US was constructed, there was a real opportunity to attract travelers from south of the border. And then when the Trans-Canada Highway was completed and the Lake Superior Circle Tour became operational, the park, the tourist camp, boomed. Uh, significant uh, attendance at the park, where you, would, in any one evening, you would have over 100 families registered. Uh, and in fact, the, the the field next door to the park, or to the tourist camp, had to be used uh, for overflow. Uh, 18 log cabins, 18 smaller cabins, uh, plus the lodge, plus central uh, uh, kitchen, washroom, shower room facilities. One of the key features at the tourist camp was evening fireside events. These are also called powwows, where representatives of the Fort Wayne First Nation would come in traditional garb and entertain the, uh, the audience. And you can see from uh, the pictures on either end, the, the crowds were massive in terms of the um, attendance. On the one on the left, you can see Art Woodnell's uh, arm reaching out from the right-hand side uh, as he uh, conducted the, the evening. And one of the features of these events was the uh, awarding of an Indigenous name to a special guest. And not only did that happen here at Chippewa Park, but at one point, a group uh, rent, went to Duluth in 1949 for the Fall Festival, and they uh, uh, awarded a name to uh, the famous Bob Hope. Um, showed here where they were met comparing his Glengarry uh, hat to the uh, uh, the bonnet worn by uh, Andy Bannon uh, from the Fort Wayne First Nation. Key, fe key feature at the beach, or key feature at Chippewa is the beach, uh, public swimming beach, 
uh, one of the few in the city of Fort William, uh, if not Thunder Bay, very popular. We've had some problems with it recently in the last 30 years in terms of, of water quality. Um, on the right, uh, two women. Uh, the woman in the house coat was uh, Irene Mislow, the lifeguard, and visiting her was Noni Luck, uh, who became Noni Johnson, uh, a longtime camper at Chippewa uh, Beach and Sandy Beach, and spouse of, uh, of Harvey Johnson. Uh, their son, Stephen, still has a camp at Sandy Beach. Longtime history by that family. For many years, the park had a bandstand in the lake. And you can see this copy of this postcard here. Uh, and what's unique about this postcard is that there is no rock dock on the other side of it. This was the open bay that was where the park was developed. Now this bandstand had entertainment every Sunday afternoon from the city band. And because of its location in the lake and the power of the water, the sound was heard throughout the entire shoreline. Very, very popular. And of course, Chippewa Park would not uh, be it without the, uh, uh, the role of animals. Right from that first coon and set of squirrels that H. Uh, Mills donated, uh, there has always been animals at Chippewa Park. Even today, even with the, uh, the existing wildlife uh, facility being closed. Top left-hand corner, people feeding the monkeys, uh, salt, pepper, and sage. Uh, uh, the, the one below that, unfortunately, I uh, didn't get that crop right, but that's a woman feeding one of the bears, uh, other cages at the bottom, and, and uh, on the right-hand side, some of the large animals that were uh, on display at the park. This map shows the, the ongoing changes uh, in terms of animal captivity. The, uh, the green uh, areas, the, uh, the lateral one beside the main parking lot and the circle in the water, that was the original location of some, for some small animal uh, uh, enclosures, including uh, uh, waterfowl. Uh, then there was the development of large areas, the, the, the blue areas where uh, moose, elk, uh, buffalo uh, were contained. The light blue was another iteration of that. And some of you will remember that in that enclosure was a big blue moose. Uh, that was Paul Bunyan's moose from a parade that was held uh, in Fort William at one point in time. The, uh, the orange areas is where the, the, the second last iteration, a uh, series of, of, of cages, a snowball was down at one end, uh, the bears were in their own enclosure, uh, monkey house, as well as some other uh, 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 small animals along the side. And then finally, uh, after the, the, the orange group was closed, uh, over 10 years, it took park staff, uh, led by Frank Manning, to build the, uh, the current wildlife exhibit uh, at the uh, other end of the, the main part of the park. There, these are the pictures of some of the final uh, residents of the, uh, the wildlife exhibit. Uh, really well cared for. Uh, council made the decision uh, to close it, combination of those on council who wanted to save money and those on council who did not believe that uh, animals should be uh, uh, contained and should be left in the wild. One of the other features of Chippewa Park was the, uh, the cottages along Chippewa Beach. These were uh, pole log frame design with canvas walls. Uh, they were rented out for the full summer uh, to local residents. Uh, later on, a number of more modern buildings, uh, uh, framed uh, dwellings with uh, wood siding were constructed. And they were, they were all removed in the 1960s to make way for additional uh, public picnic areas. Most of the, uh, the wood frame ones were relocated uh, around the corner, uh, just past the toboggan slide uh, in an area called the Shale Pit. And those were offered to the, uh, uh, the renters uh, who had them. For a number of years, uh, very popular toboggan slide and uh, pond rink, uh, uh, including rental toboggans, uh, warming house which in the old uh, Fort William uh, Yacht Club building uh, and uh, uh, sanitary facilities. 
staffed by uh, a number of operators uh, who uh, controlled the flow of the uh, of, of the toboggans going down. And of course, playground equipment, uh, always popular uh, for, for the younger children. Uh, the one of the most popular one was the one on the top left, which was the rocket ship. Uh, people are still chatting about that on Facebook. Where did it go? Why isn't it back? Uh, but very, very much enjoyed by the young folks. Then there were the large group picnics, uh, Great Lakes Athletic Association, Can Car Recreation Association. Those two were the major picnics. They were also the major employers in Thunder Bay at the time. And uh, they were so important to the park that they got to book two uh, successive weekends uh, to hold their, uh, their picnics uh, because they needed a rain date. Uh, both had stage shows, and you can see on the left uh, part of the Can Car uh, uh, presentation, uh, the usual uh, races and, uh, and other activities, uh, tickets for the rides, ice cream, pop, and what have you. They were joined by the CNR, a range of churches, a range of unions, and a range of ethnic organizations. And Chippewa was also music. Through the, 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 uh, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, there was always musical activity inside of the pavilion, as well as outside of the bandstand. Uh, top left corner, uh, more recently, uh, the Roy Coran Jazz Big Band. Uh, and in fact, you can see uh, uh, Roy sitting with his back to the, uh, to the camera, uh, directing uh, the orchestra. On the right, and we don't know whether this one is uh, a local orchestra or whether it was one of the groups that came with the, uh, the, the uh, passenger ships on the lakes who would uh, regularly bring all of their passengers out to Thunder, out to Chippewa Park on the street railway, uh, feed them a fine dining meal and uh, a dance uh, with the orchestra from, from the ship. Um, Bottom left is the Thorns, one of the local rock bands of the uh, uh, of the 60s, and on the right is one of the many iterations of the city band. Uh, and I think that gentleman standing is Ron Bottas, who was the MC for the day. 1967, the Recreation Division established a uh, children's day camp. It operates continually till today. Uh, children were bussed out uh, daily. For two weeks at a time, they usually had one sleepover, uh, including a, a show and tell for, for mom and dad and, the, uh, and, and their siblings. And as I said, it continues today. And so it's quite popular and it's quite valuable. It provides an opportunity for city kids to get out into the, the rural area and, and learn about nature. One difference about Chippewa Park as compared to all other parks of this type in Thunder Bay it's never stayed still. It's changed with the times. The amusements have changed. The facilities have changed. The summer residents have been and gone. Uh, the tourist camp has changed. Uh, animal display has changed many, many times. Uh, the use of the fields has changed. The, uh, the picnic areas have, have had ups and downs. Uh, entertainment has changed. It's the maximum flexibility. And you won't find any other park in Thunder Bay that has evolved in the way that Chippewa has. Boulevard certainly hasn't. Centennial hasn't. Chapel South hasn't. Uh, now, I'm separating out the play fields where uh, different sports come and go. Uh, but in terms of, of leisure parks, Chippewa has been unique uh, and has been very important. So the final period of time is the restoration area, er, era which started in 2001, continues today, and will continue for the foreseeable future. In 2000, the City of Thunder Bay undertook a master plan for Chippewa Park. And one of the consultants uh, in the team that, uh, that got the contract is on this Zoom uh, meeting tonight, Margaret Wallen, and she made the point of saying, uh, to us and in the master plan that if this master plan was to be implemented, that there was a need for a friends of organization, someone to keep an eye on progress, someone 
some organization to push council to live up to the, 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 the items within the master plan. So Larry Grace, who was my boss at Chippewa for a number of years, fellow camper, uh, and I called a public meeting. We had 35, 40, 45 people out at Mary J. Black Library and collectively decided, yes, there was a need for the Friends of Chippewa Park. And we decided at that point in time that our mandate would be to, to be an advocacy group. We weren't planning on doing any work. We just wanted to be in council's face and make sure that they, they lived up to their commitment. Well, sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for. We went to council to tell them that we were in existence. And that council turned around and said, okay, here's $100,000. Why don't you go see what you can do to improve the park? Four or five months later, we came back, gave a report to council on, on where we were headed. And they surprised us again by awarding us another $100,000, this time conditional on us getting matching money from others, whether it's other government or private sector, what have you. So those two decisions by council forced us to change what our role was. And we went from advocacy to implementation. We got incorporated, we got charitable status. So in the 20 years since we became into existence, we have raised and invested $10 million in that park. We've repaired the pavilion, it was ready to fall down. We restructured all of the concrete block buildings to have them all look like they belong in a wilderness park with half log siding. We built new buildings, new uh, tourist reception center at the tourist camp, seven new log cabins. We uh, built a new RV park uh, over the existing one. We updated the uh, washroom facilities to meet the uh, accessibility requirements of the, of the day. Uh, as I mentioned before, we rebuilt the pavilion, rebuilt the floors, foundations, the walls. We buried all of the uh, electrical and telephone cables. We did a lot of work in, on the beach, uh, not only dredging it, constructing and retraining walls, which we had to remove this year because of the storm damage, uh, uh, storm sewers to divert water away from it. But also too, we, we came in just as Walkerton hit. And we were the first facility that had to go through post-Walkerton rules. So we ended up redoing all of the underground uh, potable water systems in the main part of the park. That was one of our contributions that we hadn't planned on, but needed to be done. Because as Bill Hollenbeck once told me, make sure you do things right. You don't wanna go back in and have to redo it uh, because somebody's come along with an idea of what you're gonna do on the surface. So as a result of all of our efforts, Chippewa has turned around. Uh, we operate Tuesday night jam sessions, uh, Sundays in the park outdoor concert series, thanks to Grant from uh, the Recreation and Culture Division. Uh, Recreation has, and Culture have brought the annual Kite Festival out to Chippewa. Now, interestingly enough, this happened because there was construction going to be happening at Prince Arthur's Landing, and they needed to find a location for the Kite Festival, which was becoming very popular. Well, once they saw how it worked at Chippewa, they decided they're going to keep it there because we're so much more versatile. For 10 years, we ran the Bill Beavis Family Fun Day. Um, uh, Bill Beavis, as many of you will remember, was the manager of Parks and Recreation, worked his way up through, uh, through the system, and uh, loved, loved Chippewa. And so we celebrated his, his life at the time. He was, he was with us uh, with a, a, a free family fun day, uh, open to all at no cost. Uh, St. Joseph's moved the Benny Birch's birthday party out to Chippewa in its final years. Shelter House Relay. 24-hour relay. Uh, Chippewa was perfect for a number of years while it, until it ran its course. Métis Nation of Ontario annual assembly was held at Chippewa Park. We're, we're regularly booked every weekend for weddings, receptions, showers, family reunions. People love the, the dance hall. They love the surroundings. The uh, Great Lakes Cities Initiative uh, held a one-day conference uh, with mayors from around uh, all five Great Lakes uh, attending to, 
to see what Thunder Bay had to offer and, so, and also in celebration of water, the quality of water. National Aboriginal Day uh, was held at, uh, at Chippewa Park uh, once. Uh, this here's a picture of uh, Lisa Lacko, now retired, uh, interviewing one of the Indigenous entertainers who performed that day. And in the center is the logo for the Outdoor Writers of Canada. They were our first conference slash meeting held at Chippewa after our major renovations. And in fact, we finished the floor in the dance hall one hour before uh, the, their conference started. We know how to, to bring things close to the edge. Thundering Women's Festival, a uh, couple of years uh, for, had performances at Chippewa. Uh, Susan Aglukark, uh, Heather Keldy were two of the uh, performers at that, uh, uh, that four day event. Melodrama. Many of you will remember uh, Moonlight Melodrama uh, operating at Chippewa. Once the facilities deteriorated, they no longer uh, were able to do it. Once we got the pavilion rebuilt, Rob McLeod Capital Players uh, uh, came to us and said, we want to do melodrama. They do it twice a week, each July, uh, every summer and have for the last well, about 15 years. Great fun. In Around 2003, we held an official reopening of the park after we did the majority of our uh, restorations. We had 10,000 people attend that day. And in fact, we off we offered uh, amusement ride tickets for a very reduced price in celebration. The lineup at the ticket booth started at 12.30 in the afternoon. Ticket booth didn't open till one. And the lineup was still there at 12.30 the next morning. It was just an amazing day. Uh, and it shows that, that Chippewa can attract people if there's something programmed. So one of the things that's happened at Chippewa Park in the last 30 to 40 years has been some negatives. The daily bus service was canceled by council in 1992. There's been ongoing permanent staff reduction. There's, as a result, decline in building and facility maintenance. We lost the toboggan slide. We had to remove a roller coaster, but no replacement attraction has even been considered. The wildlife exhibit now closed. The failure of all of us to resolve the water quality issue on the main beach. People still think the park is closed because the beaches are seen to be closed. Recently, the operating week was, was changed from seven days a week to five. The season was shortened. The Canada Day celebrations were taken away from Chippewa Park and, and moved elsewhere in the community. So let me go back to the positive. Our C.W. Parker Carousel, a heritage designated facility constructed in 1915 one of three of its kind left in the world. We've been lovingly restoring this over the last three to four years. Our first step was to get a restoration plan from, from a world-renowned expert, Lisa Parr, who also created a maintenance plan for us because if you're, we're going to restore this, we better darn well have a plan on how to keep it in good shape from here on in. We worked with the city's Heritage Advisory Committee we created our own heritage, Carousel Heritage and Records Committee, and we've now raised and invested $1.3 million in this project. That's part of the 10 million I talked about earlier. Funding from Canada 150, funding from the City of Thunder Bay, donations from individual adopters and donors, and one of the most significant components has been the in-kind labor and skills that have been donated by artisans within this community. Terry Herdick, who's on the call tonight, uh, has been leading the work of the Thunder Bay Carvers, uh, who have been who have carved all of the replacement figures for the rounding boards and uh, for the, the center column panels, as well as for two new chariots. Incredible work, has a value of well over $400,000. Hammershell High School is building us two new uh, wheelchair accessible chariots with the carvings on the exterior being done by the carvers. 
Linda Siskar, who is, is, has been doing all the embellishments of the, of the, uh, the carved items uh, to br bring them alive, make them really stand out. Laverandre High School have taken the Ely gas engine, the original Ely gas engine that came uh, with the carousel in 1934 when it was purchased, and are refurbishing it. Now that, that engine has not operated for over 50 years. It was in the bush, in the mud at Chippewa, and we pulled it out, brought it over there, and they're doing amazing work. Superior Collegiate have taken on the task of painting iconic images on the panels on the rounding boards. This picture here is uh, Faith Watley, one of the, the students who's working on those images, and they'll all be Northwestern Ontario, primarily Thunder Bay images. Things like the Pagoda, Mount McKay, Sleeping Giant, um, uh, Kakabeka Falls, those kind of facilities, Hoito. Our, we're almost there in terms of, of, of the restoration. Uh, we've got the jewels to add to the horses. We're finalizing the rounding boards and the center column panels. As I mentioned, we, we, we're, re, we're building the new uh, chariots. Uh, we originally had, had planned on having this all done by May of, of this year in time for the anniversary. However, this thing called COVID intervened and uh, totally uh, distorted our plan. So we're now aiming for, for May of 2022. We also have applied for funding to construct an enclosure to house the carousel. We were told right from day one by Lisa Parr that you need to have a building to, to house this to protect it from here on in. It needs to be climate controlled, needs to be secure. Um, it needs to be an area where you can really properly display it and enjoy it. And you can see some examples of, of, of some of the, the carousel enclosures elsewhere in North America. We haven't decided on what we're doing yet. Um, we, we have applied for funds. We're optimistic that we will get approval. Once we do, we will engage an architect uh, to look at how we can add an enclosure to the, uh, the existing pavilion, which was one of the requirements of, of one of the funders. We're also going to include an artisan's workshop because we want to be able to, to have those carvers or those painters come out and teach others how to do what they've done. Uh, a gift shop, and then an interpretive area, interpretive area that not only celebrates the history of the carousel itself, but celebrates the history of the restoration and the people who made it possible. Final couple of notes. Uh, our thanks to the Chronicle Journal, who have been publishing a series of articles in their Tuesday editions outlining the history of Chippewa Park. The third one was there today. We expect to have a total of 12 to 16 individual articles that will be published to try and, and reconnect people to the park. This year is the 100th anniversary uh, and COVID willing, uh, we're hoping to have a commemoration ceremony on July 15th. And then the big one will be the Family Festival, July 29th to August 2nd. Uh, we're hoping to have five days of nonstop stage entertainment a children's festival, fireworks, you name it. Uh, we're also, we're, and do so, we're, we've got a call for entertainers uh, out there. And we're also hoping to hold a number of reunions. There's been a lot of people who have worked at the park, whether it's on the, the, on the outside or in the pavilion, uh, that we'd like to get back together just to share stories and, and reminisce. There's a summer residence of Chippewa and Sandy and, and, and their descendants. Uh, who have lots of memories and, and have lots of friendships uh, developed over the years. And thirdly is the day camp staff, that uh, there's, been, there's been literally thousands of staff working there over the years. And certainly there's been a lot of chatter on Facebook uh, by some of them for the last little while. So some credits and thanks. Chronicle Journal we talked about. Jackie Cleveland, who is an, an employee of the... Uh, Thunder Bay Public Library was a recreation division researcher back in 1982. And it's her research that has formed the basis of a lot of the work that we're doing around creating the articles uh, for, that are in the Times in the Chronicle Journal and on our website. Uh, Murray Angus, happens to be my brother, uh, is helping in terms of, of, of writing style. 
uh, of, of those articles. Thunder Bay City Archives. Uh, we were able to get a lot of information from them on Chippewa Park and some of the legal aspects of it. Thunder Bay Museum, the paper done by Eugenio Padovizzi uh, for Tori Tronru was, was crucial in us understanding the land acquisition. And finally, Michael de Jong. Michael has been the chair of our Heritage and Records Committee and has been instrumental in keeping us on track of making sure that we follow due process to make sure that, that the restoration is done according to the rules that it should be done. Now, there's always has to be a commercial. But we're still raising money for the carousel. Uh, we've got an online carousel auction happening April 21st to 30th. You can bid on an original mirror from the carousel, an original set of stirrups from the carousel. We have framed prints of Lisa Parr's drawings, which were originally intended just for the purpose of ensuring that we got the color schemes right on the horses. But these are amazing, amazing items. Um, you can start previewing the items on April the 14th. You just have to go to Chippewa Park, uh, dot ca slash auction uh, or to save our carousel dot, dot com to get connected that's it uh, thank you very much for your time more than happy to respond to questions there's two of our our websites and three of our logos so over to you folks if i can figure out how to disconnect Well, thanks so much for that presentation. I'm sure um, I'm sure you'd be getting applause from everyone in attendance if uh, we were set up to do that. So, just a reminder to everyone, um, just a reminder that you can um, use the uh, Q and A button along the bottom of the screen to ask questions. I think Scott and I will also be monitoring the chat if you're better able to uh, access the chat to uh, to ask your questions as well. Uh, so Ian, I can just start with one um, and just wondering how you think uh, the pandemic in this really strange year will change the way the park is used in the, uh, the medium and the longer term. Excellent question. And let me, re let me start by saying how, much, how it's changed it already. Uh, we are seeing more people out at Chippewa Park these days than we've ever seen before during the, during the fall and winter that people have recognized this is an area that has beauty, um, that uh, has a lot of interesting things, a lot of, lot of birds, um, the, vis the vistas of the sleeping giant, uh, certainly last, the last couple of weeks in terms of the, uh, the blue ice, uh, significant numbers of people were out taking a look at, at, at that, exploring the shorelines. So it already has changed. Uh, we're hoping that once the, the COVID restrictions are, are uh, lifted, that the people who have rediscovered Chippewa are gonna keep coming back. Um, but as I, I mentioned in the slide deck, that part of the thing that, that has to happen is there has to be more programming, it has to be more events, it has to be more reasons to bring people out to the park. Uh, the city's recognized that with, Marina, with the Prince Arthur's Landing. They're doing significant programming, excellent programming there, and that's bringing people in over and above those who just just go there for a walk. Um, so we're 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 going to do our best to try and do that programming. And certainly the um, our plan for the uh, the family festival uh, this summer, if we're able to go with it. And if not, we're going to reschedule it for next year. That will reintroduce people to the park as well and show both them and city government the benefit of of maintaining the park properly. And, and retaining it as well. So Ian, what is the status of, um, of the building? Is, is funding all the way there? What is, what is the need left? We have, uh, we have $300,000 from the city that's been approved. Uh, we have an application pending to the Northern Ontario Heritage uh, fund corporation, uh, which should be going to their board any time now. And we have a final application into the uh, to Heritage Canada, 
in fact, I've got a conference call with the, uh, the rep from them tomorrow uh, to uh, respond to a couple more questions that they have. So they're working their way through. Um, we don't expect to hear uh, until sometime in the summer and would be looking at a uh, design work during the summer with hopefully construction starting in the fall, if not uh, early spring in, um, in 2022. Okay, thank you. I'm Mr. Curious. Go ahead, Zara. Mm -hmm. uh, I was gonna say, I'm curious about the relationship with transit because you did mention the importance of getting that street, street railway built early in the, uh, the early years of the park. And, um, and then having the, uh, the lack of the daily transit more recently, um, just sort of what the relationship is there. Well, that, the initial decision <clears throat> was a budget decision of council. They were looking to where they could save money as they always do. Uh, ridership was down to something like 800 uh, passengers a summer, which isn't great. Um, I didn't include in the presentation, uh, but we were able, we, the Friends of Chippewa were able to convince council uh, a, a few years ago to reinstate uh, Saturday and Sunday service. Um, but it was, a, it was a, a limited budget. So it's sort of been whittled away. There's fewer Saturdays and Sundays that uh, uh, have uh, uh, where it's been provided. Um, but it, that's one of the challenges that we have is, is convincing council. And, and I wasn't able to do it, you know, being on council for 15 years. So we're hoping that uh, the big celebration will, will point out the benefit of, of, of this kind of service. And in fact, uh, part of our budget for the festival is including chartering city buses to run full service through those five days. Thank you for that. Uh, so a question has come into the chat box. Um, how are you personally connected to Chippewa Park? Well, uh, my mom and dad ran the tourist camp uh, uh, from uh, 1945. I was born in 47, lived out there until I was 21, 22, uh, uh, worked at the tourist camp, worked uh, uh, picking paper uh, at the main part of the park, worked in the concession, ran the uh, toboggan slide rentals and concession uh, during the winter. Uh, uh, after my mom passed away, I, the camp, her, her house became my camp. I had it through till 87. And then when I'm working for Parks and Rec, uh, I took on responsibilities for Chippewa as well. And then of course the Friends of Chippewa the last 20 years. So it really is my neighborhood. Thanks, we've also had a question about the plans for the breakwater area. Uh, the quick answer to that is on hold. Uh, the um, both the federal and provincial governments refused to fund the removal of the wooden dock and the relo relocation of the armor stone, even though the provincial government funded a, uh, the creation of a plan on how to do it. Uh, the I'm trying to think how to phrase this properly. One of the reasons for the removal was the fact that. Uh, an earlier study said if you remove it, then the water quality in the beach will improve significantly. Because the Chippewa Beach was one of the areas of concern under the, uh, uh, the, under the environment uh, in terms of the, of the remedial action plan. Well, the government has changed the rules and they've doubled the amount of contamination required before it's considered a problem area, even though the water quality hasn't changed. And the Ontario government used that as the reason for not uh, uh, providing the funding. And we need a million dollars uh, to do the work. Uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is trying to uh, convince the, the local remedial action plan committee that we haven't met the requirements yet uh, because during uh, low water of Lake Superior or hot temperatures, that's still an incubator because it's very shallow and that, that there, there will continue to be times when the water is not, uh, not safe and we think it's 
it's justifiable to spend the money to remove it. Great, thanks for that explanation. Um, so in the question and answer box, we've got a, a couple questions in the queue, but one uh, comment to pass along, uh, Brent Scully says, great talk, thanks Ian. And, uh, but there is a question there. Um, when do you hope to have the carousel operational? Well, um, that's up to the province of Ontario. Uh, they uh, indicated last year that no amusements in Ontario shall operate. Uh, we, have, we have not stopped operating the carousel, by the way, uh, except for last summer, even through, through the restoration. Uh, the first summer, half the horses were restored. The other half were not. All 28 of them were on the, on the carousel. Um, we're fully expecting uh, the carousel to be able to be put back together uh, this summer uh, and operational. But again, that will depend on the province. Thanks. A lot of the questions that are coming in are about uh, specific features. So I have a question about what happened to the ride on railway at the park. Uh, that the um, Lakeshore Express uh, and the uh, boat swings were owned by the Altman family. Uh, and they decided to end their relationship uh, with the, the, the city of Thunder Bay. And they moved everything out to Kakabeka where they created the uh, Happy Land Trailer Park. Uh, so they, it was privately owned and they had full control over it and uh, um, made that decision, which was regretful because it, it was a very good attraction at the park. So uh, a follow-on comment to that. Uh, one of the attendees says that the Ferris wheel also went with them. So, uh, but a additional question um, was, what happened to the toboggan slide? The um, my recollection is the toboggan slide was another victim of, of, of budget cuts. Uh, however, uh, it would have ended up being closed in any case a few years later when the uh, uh, Parks Department, in an attempt to improve the water quality, removed the end of the wooden dock. Uh, think of it as a hockey stick, and they, re they removed the blade. And that blade is where the, the larger toboggans would hit uh, from coming down the chutes and would, would not go into the lake because there was usually open ice out there. So once that section of the dock was removed, uh, there was no way uh, that the toboggan slide could be reopened, uh, at least not at that location. And then the, um, uh, during the restoration process, the Friends of Chippewa removed the top of the hill, which was an artificial hill to begin with, and restored the, uh, the terrain to uh, its original condition. Uh, maybe a less specific question now. Um, why is the carousel so significant for our community? Well, uh, I guess at least two reasons. One, it's 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 been operational at Chippewa since 1935, so it's got a long history of of providing excitement and imagination uh, triggering to children uh, of, of of many generations. Uh, it is one of three left of its kind in the world. Uh, and uh, by, for that, it's important as well. Um, but it's just, it's just a, an ideal feature for uh, a park like Chippewa. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the next question is, uh, says, I am interested in the statue of the Buffalo that once was on a plinth on the north side of the park. Was any research done on its history and origin and why it was removed. Okay, uh, I don't recall, uh, you say Buffalo? Correct. I don't recall a Buffalo, uh, uh, and certainly we have never done any research on it. The only thing I can, I can think of is the reference to the Blue Moose, uh, Paul Bunyan's, that was a uh, uh, part of a, a um, of a parade uh, years ago, Chippewa ended up being the place where those things went. 
we once had a replica of, uh, of uh, Fort William uh, that was on the back of a truck that was placed at the entrance of the park. Uh, Blue Moose was put in the uh, inside the fence with the animals, and it, it eventually just rotted away. But if, if, if the person uh, has detailed information of that, we would be happy to, to, to learn of it, and, and we would definitely do the research. And what would be the best way for someone to contact you directly about that? Uh, Chippewa at tbaytel.net. All right. And a question about who it is that organizes the programming at the park. That's uh, that's done jointly. Uh, well, sorry. Um, Culture and Recreation does the uh, uh, Kite Festival. Uh, Lorraine Lorty, who is the president of the Friends of Chippewa, uh, looks after the uh, Sunday in the Park concerts. Uh, we put out an annual call for entertainers. Uh, and uh, Kathy Sawicki, our vice chair, vice president, is now looking after the uh, arrangements for the um, Tuesday night jam sessions. Okay, that appears to be all the questions we have uh, in the hopper. If anyone has any other questions, please uh, do put them in the chat box or into the question and answer function. We'll just give a couple minutes for anyone else who's got any follow-up questions. So let me let me tell you one one anecdote. I made reference to to Frank Banning uh, earlier on in the in the uh, in the presentation. He was the operator of the carousel. And I'm told, I don't remember this myself, but I'm told at the age of five, and keep in mind this was a different, different era, I would take off from the tourist camp and head down to the, the merry-go-round. Frank would spot me, put me on a horse, keep me there all afternoon, and then bring me home at the end of his shift. That's the kind of park it was. That's the kind of family we were. Well, thanks so much um, for that presentation, for answering all of these questions. Um, we do have people in the chat and the Q&A saying how much they enjoyed the presentation. So it was really wonderful having you on for, for our, um, our March presentation. Well, thank you. And I really do appreciate this opportunity because the more people that learn about the history of Chippewa, the, uh, the more they'll think about Chippewa next time they want to go someplace. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I hope we get to uh, see you in, at the park in person this summer. Me too. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, that concludes uh, tonight's lecture. Um, if you, uh, you wanted to watch it again or wanted to share it with other friends, we will hope to have the recording posted to the museum's YouTube channel in the next week or so. Uh, until then, uh, Feel free to visit www.thunderbaymuseum.com uh, to learn more about the museum and continue your support. Thanks everyone for attending. I will be closing down the Zoom uh, here momentarily. <laughs>